Good morning, everybody, or oh, should I say good afternoon. Uh, Leanne Wells here, Chief Executive of the Consumers Health Forum. Uh, welcome to this webinar um, that we're hosting today. Can I firstly acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're on here in Canberra, that participants are on, and pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past and present, and any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people participating in the webinar. And a warm welcome to everyone. I think we've got over 100 people online um, based on our registration, so that's fantastic. Our aim today is to give a brief overview of the Australian health system and to provide some insights into the policy context in, in which we're all operating and uh, the policy context that's affecting the health system we all use. There were two main drivers for us deciding to do this webinar today and the one planned for the 15th of March. The first was as preparation for an upcoming Consumer and Carer Leadership Colloquium. CHF has partnered with Mental Health Australia and the National Rural Health Alliance to host on the 21st of March here in Canberra. What we wanted to do was to give participants some background information because the colloquium is focused on emerging consumer leaders and we didn't want to assume that the participants in the colloquium had all the background or nuances about um, directions in national health reform that we do. But secondly, um, we wanted to meet the demand that we've had expressed to us from CHF consumer representatives to better understand the policy context that we're operating in to help them to be more effective in their roles in what is very rapidly moving environment. And that demand alone by some of our quite experienced consumer representatives and advocates confirmed our thinking that this information, this style of information we're going to be presenting today and on the 15th would be useful for the newer and less experienced um, up and coming uh, consumer leaders and advocates that we're targeting at the colloquium. So that, that's the background. So in summary, it's a, a webinar series targeted at both the consumer and carer colloquium attendees, um, but a broader group of consumers and carers from across uh, our respective networks as well. I'm sure those of you listening know, but if you don't, uh, the Consumers Health Forum is the uh, peak body for Australian healthcare consumers um, funded under an Australian government program called the Health Peak Bodies and or Health Peak and Advisory Bodies Program. So what we'll do today is we'll we'll be presenting in two parts. You can ask questions as we go along by typing them into the box, which is below the video screen. There, I think it's pretty easy to see. What we'll do is pause at the end of the first section of the presentation and answer any questions that have arisen. If there are a lot of them, we'll try and get as many answered as possible. But if we don't get them to them today, we'll collect them and collate some answers to them and post those questions and answers on the website when the slides go up. And then there'll also be time for questions on the second half of the presentation using that same process. So the first part of our presentation today, that's going to be presented by Joe Root, the policy manager here at CHF. Um, that deals with an overview of the health system, it looks at things like the size of the sector, funding responsibility and key components like Medicare. And then the second part is going to be about the government wide policy agenda that's currently influencing health policy and that presents both opportunities and challenges for health reform. And then our second webinar next Wednesday on the 15th, we'll join up with and co-present that with Mental Health Australia and the National Rural Health Alliance. And that'll give you some details on some specific and current health reforms that we're not covering here today. Okay, so hi, it's Joe here. Welcome to everybody. Um, 
For some of you, this may be information that you already know. It's a bit of Health Policy 101. For others, it may come as new information, but we thought it important to, to give some background information on how the health system works. Um, so the first part is about the size of the health sector and total expenditure in Australia, as you can see from the slide, is, is was um, $161.6 billion in 2014-15, which is the last year for which we have reliable AIHW figures. And that amounts to about $6,846 per person if we average it out. For the first time, this is accounting for 10% of gross domestic product. Um, the measure often taken to see how important health is in the overall economy. Um, that figure of 10% looks high, but is around about the uh, average for developed countries through the OECD. Uh, lower than the US, um, and uh, which sits around about com same as countries like France, Germany, um, and Denmark, countries that we would normally want to compare ourselves with. Total of that total, uh, 161.6 billion, 108.2 billion was government expenditure, which means that another 52, 53 billion. Um, was spent by individuals either as out-of-pocket expenses from actual individuals or through contributions to private health insurance or private payments of other sort. That includes government expenditure of both Commonwealth and state and territory. And the Commonwealth health expenditure is about a quarter of tax, just over a quarter of tax revenues, which I think all of that shows you why health gets quite a, a prominent position in government thinking. It forms a large part of the government budget. And when government is looking at budget deficits, budget surpluses, but particularly deficits, you can see why they're concerned about keeping a lid on health expenditure. It's to keep that system sustainable. We don't want it to grow as a percentage of tax revenues. And it's so, so that drives a lot of the health policy that we um, that we asked to do. Basically, you know, it's a brave person who's going to describe how the health system in Australia works. We've got a very complicated health system here, much com much more complicated than many. Uh, other countries. We've got a mixed system of public and private in funding, as I've already outlined. Direct service provision, where we have some public provision, some private provision. And then we have planning and service delivery, which also sits across, across public and private. It's also important to remember that there's joint responsibilities, and actually it goes across all levels of government. The Commonwealth, state and territory, and local government plays a role in how the system is developed, designed and delivered. So that, and just to show you how complicated in fact it is, here's this amazing diagram that just looks like somebody's having a nightmare really. Um, if you have a look at this, and I apologize if it's not that clear, but you can get it up on the slides later. It basically shows that there's an intricate system of um, funding flows from the Commonwealth government, which is on the left hand side, across to private, to the private sector, to state and government. And that this is done through direct payments from Commonwealth government to state governments, direct payments to service providers. It's also done through things like the tax rebate for the private health insurance. So you've got the service delivery uh, components and, and direct funding, and then you've also got health expenditure through the taxation system. So it's often um, people question whether we actually have a system, and some of us who've worked in it for a while will possibly question as well, but there's key components that we need to have a look at. I think this diagram probably um, is a little clearer, if nothing else, because it's in nice colours and it's a circle. Um, and this one shows the funding and responsibility for the various components. And if we start at the centre of the circle, it shows the shares of um, funding for hospitals, 
primary health care and other health services. As you can see, the hospitals is the dark green part and they take up 40% of funding. Primary health care takes up 38% and other services are 20. Hospital includes, if you go to the next circle out, it includes both public hospital services and private hospital services. And you can see that by far public hospital services take out in the orange sector, take out a lot more than um, private. Primary health is included all health services delivered in the community, the things we normally think of in primary health, so GP, GPs, medications, um, and also uh, both prescription medications and over-the-counter medications, so things you might buy like your uh, paracetamol, um, cough and cold medications, things like that. It also would include uh, payments for primary health networks and um, and other health practitioners where they come under, such as allied health professionals, if it's delivered um, in the in the sector in the primary healthcare sector. The others include everything else basically, so they um, include things like um, other non-GP medical services, medical research. Uh, so that uh, health aids and appliances, patient transport and health activities. So they're quite a large sector of other that often uh, when we think of the health system tend to get ignored, but they pay a critical part in the whole process. If we go to the middle ring, which, which is the um, orange, blue and red, you can see that there that the um, Basically, in hospitals, as I've said, combined public and private sector, state and territory and private providers all play a role. State and territory governments take responsibility for providing public hospitals, but the Commonwealth helps fund them. Um, the, the distribution of the services shows their importance. If you look at primary health care, you can see the biggest, one of the biggest rings at parts out there is actually medications. So we often think that GP services and other things that would take up the main part of that, but actually medications are equally important. It's also interesting to note that when you look at that middle circle that the Commonwealth doesn't have sole responsibility for delivering anything. The Commonwealth um, takes uh, a role of uh, being the funder really and also determines what is delivered to some extent. They, they decide how, what they're going to buy and how much they're going to give for it, but they don't take responsibility for delivering most services. Even GP services, which we traditionally think of as funded by the government, by the Commonwealth government, is delivered by a network of private um, GPs. And so they can't basically, uh, the, the, and it's important to remember that the Australian government funder and policy setter and in our work at CHF that's how we deal with them but they're not the they're not the service provider. The final part of this is the outside circle the grey and green um, and two shades of grey. Um, the pale green shows the Commonwealth and shows where the Commonwealth has chosen to put its money so obviously it takes up some of public hospitals but not the bulk of public hospitals. Uh, under 50% of the funding for public hospitals comes from the Commonwealth. And then you've got the Commonwealth also involved in community health. Uh, you've obviously got them involved in medications and in doctor's services. So they're, they're the key player in that part. The state and territory um, is not involved so much in GP services. And then you look at what is what is delivered through the private sector, the dark grey in that, and that's where you start to see how private includes both private health insurance and individuals paying out-of-pocket costs. And that starts to grow in various sectors, very small in the public hospital system, obviously larger in private hospitals. But when you get to doctor services and medications, individuals are actually paying a significant proportion of the cost. So 
we all have an interest in how this money is spent, not just because we pay taxes and pay the Medicare levy, but in a large extent, people are actually consumers and carers are paying out of their own pockets. And I think that's one of the reasons why we at CHF have been so interested in um, in how in in what happens to out of pocket, and we're always saying to government. Uh, that you, you need to have a look at the implications for out of pockets. In Australia, out of pockets and individual payments make up 20% of the health expenditure. And that's high by international standards and it's going up faster than government expenditure. So individuals are bearing more and more of the cost of health. And that may come as a surprise, given that we think that, you know, we have Medicare as a universal public health insurance scheme and provides universal access to health services. And yet we're finding that increasingly people are paying for it themselves. Well, there's three elements of Medicare, basically, pharmaceuticals, hospitals and medical services. Um, basically, the first one is the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme, which provides subsidised access to a range of prescription medicines and basically is looking to ensure that people have access to safe and effective medicines at a cost that both the individuals and the community can afford. And I think many of us probably take PBS for the Pharmaceutical Benefit Scheme for granted. It's been going since the 1960s. Um, and it provides a key part of our universal health system. We do have a system of co-payments from patients in the PBS system. And depending on whether you're a general, a concessional patient, you'll pay $6.30. Or if you're not a concessional, you'll pay $38.80. And I think that level of subsidisation probably only becomes clear to people when, if they know how much the medicine would cost. And, you know, those of us who have pets, who have animals who go to vets and get medications from the vet, know how much these things actually cost once they're not subsidised. And I think it, and increasingly uh, people are seeing that for their medicines as well. Another key component of PBS is the existence of the safety net and the PBS safety net, um, which often referred to, is designed to provide uh, guarantees to people who are regular users of a number of medicines that they will only pay a set amount of money in any given year for the for the general um, patients, that means once you get to $1,494.90, you will then drop down in any given year. Once you've paid that for PBS medications, you will drop down to the concessional fee of $6.30. For concessional patients, once they reach a, a threshold of $378, then they get the rest of the medications free. And I think that's an important part for people with chronic illnesses or e even if for uh, one year you have an acute illness or a set of acute illnesses that require a lot of medications. Yeah. It means that your decision um, is made easier about whether to get your script filled. I think it's worth noting there, though, that we are seeing an increasing trend in people not getting medicines filled, even at the concessional rates. Um, because they simply can't afford it, and that's a matter of great concern. One of the great parts of our pharmaceutical system is that we have a pharmaceutical benefits advisory committee, which is an in, that recommends um, medicines for listing, for subsidising by government. The pharmaceutical benefits advisory committee is an independent committee that makes recommendations on listings. And they do that based on the cost effectiveness of the listing. And while there's some dispute about uh, how that process is done, it probably does make, make sure that the taxpayer gets value for money and people who need them get access to innovative medicines. Currently, the minister, the uh, in PBAC, the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, um, has only one consumer representative on it, and that's Joe Watson, whom some of you will know. 
Um, we are looking to have two consumer representatives. And we're also looking to increase the number, the, the ways that consumers can have input into the assessment of medicines. The cost effectiveness is a very technical um, health economics financing tool and doesn't take into account the patient experience of the medication. And so there are, have been discussions and they're ongoing about how we can make sure that the consumer view of the, the improved quality of life they get from using a medicine uh, is taken into account in the decision process. So I think that's a work in progress at the moment. And as you can see, um, and the last point of the slide, expenditure is roughly 10.83 billion if you use one accounting method. Um, if you use the more commonly quoted accounting method, it's around about $9 billion in, in PBS expenditures. And that is a large proportion of the money. And it had been going up quite rapidly, but it's it's um, tending, last year was a bit of a blip uh, in that it went up considerably. But you can see why government is concerned about PBS expenditure. It often gets a run in the media whenever we get close to budget time and there starts budget speculation, then you know the rounds go up about, oh, well, we can find some savings in the PBS. And it can be quite attractive there. The second part of Medicare is um, hospitals. Part of the Medicare agreement, which came in in 1984, was that there would be free access to public hospital services through um, funding, from, funding from the Commonwealth to sit alongside state uh, funding. This was quite a new development for most states, in, states and territories in Australia, although Queensland had had free public hospitals for quite some time. The current arrangement between the Commonwealth and the states is done through what's called the National Health Reform Agreement. Um, there have been some uh, changes to that and the government withdrew, was said it was going to change funding then changed its mind. But it's currently funded through to 2019-20 and it makes a contribution and it's not... Um, the Commonwealth funds about 37%, as you can see from their state and territory 54, and then the other, which includes private health insurance, makes up the remaining percentage. The third part or pillar of this system is the Medicare benefit schedule, uh, which provides free or subsidised treatment by health professionals, doctors, optometrists in community and in private hospitals through the MBS and I think everybody's familiar with uh, claiming their rebate back or being billed by their doctor. Again there's an independent committee which decides which um, medical services will be funded through the medical Me Medicare benefit schedule and that's the medical services advisory committee and it looks at um, again cost effectiveness is, is it a safe intervention? Is it value for money? Does it actually do what it says it's going to do? Is it worth using taxpayer money to fund? And not every medical service is on the MBS. Currently, there's a freeze on MBS rebates. Um, it's been in the papers. I'm sure most of you have seen it on the news. And this has arisen. This has increased our concern about gap payments, particularly for people who are not bulk billed under um, by their doctors. There's also an MBS review underway at the moment. There's 5,700 items on the MBS. And this review is looking to look at them all to modernize it to make sure that taxpayers are only paying for interventions that are of high value. Um, this is quite a, um, a, topic, a topic for conversation and um, discussion amongst health professionals and health policy makers that there's a feeling that some of the interventions that we do just aren't value for money and aren't good good care for, for patients. And CHF has supported the MBS review because we want people to be sure that the service they're getting will help them and that it is good value for money to help the sustainability of the process into the future. 
And the last thing we should mention there that Medicare is funded through the Medicare levy, which most of you will pay, 2% of taxable income currently. And if you're on a higher income, then you may be also charged the Medicare levy surcharge. It is important to remember that the Medicare levy does not fund the whole of the health system. It only funds a proportion of it. And as costs go up in the system and we have an aging population, more technology, um, more services available, then the more of general revenue has to go in to fund the health system. So we might pause there and see if there's any questions that um, we need to, to do to answer. Yeah. Questions. Okay. Um, one of the questions that come up, is there a way to simplify the funding and expenditure to make it easier to understand and more transparent? Uh, that's a good question. I think if you can come up with a solution for that, you've got the job as the Secretary of the Department of Health or the Health Minister. There has been a process underway through um, discussion about uh, moving responsibility to one level of government or another and there's been various attempts at this and you know we often talk about commonwealth state relations in health there was a there was an attempt by the current government uh, in a green paper to look at possible models to either make the states responsible for hospitals or the commonwealth take responsibility for everything that hasn't really advanced and there's been several um several attempts at this, partly because I think it's seen that the Commonwealth wouldn't actually be very good at running hospitals and the states don't want to take on the financial risk. And I think it's actually those two parts that were for hospital funding um, would certainly make it make it very difficult. The other um, question, the second question that several of you have asked is, does the PBS review panel take public submissions? when considering a new listing. They have started to have some public hearings. Um, they're by invitation. They're not built into the decision-making process of the PBAC, um, the, the, the committee at the moment. I think that's one of the things we're looking at. There are international models where that's done. Some, um, some patient groups have been invited to go where there's been discussion of a particular drug. Um, to talk about their experience. I think they found it very useful, if a bit daunting. And I think the committee, and certainly Joe Watson has reported back that the committee has found it um, interesting to hear people's views. And But the problem is that those views don't have a formal place in the decision-making process. So in the review that's going on about how to incorporate consumers' views, that's one of the things that we're looking at. The possibly the um, the third one I'll answer is about the PBS. You'll know if you get to the concession rate, you'll know if you reach the safety net, your pharmacist should be able to tell you. One of the problems at the moment is that it's not done centrally. So if you need if you go to the same pharmacist, they'll keep a they'll keep a record of your scripts and they'll tell you when you've reached the safety net. If you shop around with pharmacies, you're going to need to keep that record yourself. Um, this has been one of the issues that CHF and others have been advocating to have changed, that it should come up automatically, that you've reached the threshold and you should get it. It shouldn't really be up to you to decide. And, you know, that that's actually is one of the, the key the problems. And I think there's a question here from uh, about mental illness and, men and diagnoses and safe effectiveness. I think one of the issue, one of the things we're trying to do with, in the Medicare uh, benefits in the MBS review is to actually review the evidence for the interventions and to try to improve what is offered to people. You know, Bruce Robinson, the chair of that review, talks about it modernizing. And, and if we can get rid of some old practices that we know are no good, like, you know, doing arthroscopies on people's knees when they've got arthritis, then we can free up some money for other processes. So I think that's all um, 
And the last one is about activity-based funding. Activity-based funding is simply paying hospitals for what they actually do in its simplest terms. Instead of giving them a lump sum, we used to just hand over money from the Commonwealth to the state. Queensland government will get X billion dollars. Um, and they, they then chose how it was spent and there were no controls over how much work was actually done. Activity-based funding means that the Commonwealth pays is moving to a system of paying for what is actually done by the hospitals, which is more of an accountability and actually is a much more transparent way of funding. So I think that's all the questions here. So I'm not going to hand over to Leanne to talk about the current policy influences. Thanks, Joe. I will just go to the next slide. Um, there were some specifics about, about the health system. We'll do more on, on particular reform agendas running next week on the 15th um, around private health insurance and pharmacy reform and mental health reform, disability reform, aged care reform. What we wanted to do now, what we thought might be useful for you, was just have a, have a little look at a number of wider government um, reform agendas, other other I suppose influences that are, are on the wider government radar that do have an impact for health and health reform and for consumers. So we've picked five and there are many more, but um, these were the ones that we thought were worth pulling out some key points for you. Um, we picked six actually, I've just been corrected by Joe. thanks Joe. Um, and we're not going to give you, obviously, we don't have the time to give you, you know, a comprehensive policy analysis of these, um, but we just wanted to, you know, bring them to your attention really as part of the, the broader environment. But across all of these, you know, certainly part of CHF's advocacy is that we try as much as we can to look to make these initiatives um, more people-centred uh, and pursue opportunities for co-design so that consumers and carers are involved in every stage of the policy process from identifying the problems through to looking at options to designing policy and programs and services that can, can help provide solutions. So the first, and Joe touched on this, the first is, is the federal bud budget. And um, uh, you know, I think it's probably clear to us all, anyone who reads the newspaper, anyone who's on social media, that the federal budget is in deficit and that the current government is looking to reduce that deficit. So they're looking for areas where they can make um, expenditure reductions, but also areas where you know they can raise revenue to, I guess, to offset some expenditure. One of the important things to bear in mind, and this may not be well known, but um, and it is, is it is an issue of concern to CHF and others. Uh, you know, in the health sector, like like the AMA, um, that you know, health health is an asset. In economic terms, it's an area where we think uh, we should be investing. But every time uh, the health minister, and, and at the moment Minister Hunt, wants to do something new in his portfolio that involves spending new money or more money, he actually has to find offsets for that has to find savings for that from, from within his portfolio. So you can see that um, there's quite a bit of pressure, particularly given the, the trends that Joe was talking about earlier around rising health expenditures and um, you know, costs associated with new technologies and, and areas of innovation in medicine and healthcare delivery that we all want to see come with, come with a price and we have to make choices so some of the you know, health implications for the current um, budget situation are up there on the slide. You would have heard the term zombie measures. So there are some measures from the 2013-14 budget, wasn't it? That 14-15 um, budget that are still on the table um, that are concerned with um, uh, taking some saving, you know, taking some expenditure pressure off by uh, raising co-payments. Um, there is current freeze on Medicare rebates, as Joe said, but there's certainly mounting pressure to lift that. Um, and then there are some measures from within PBS, for example, um, not delivering uh, the savings that were anticipated. 
We and our partner organisations, Mental Health Australia and National Rural Health Alliance, uh, make typically make um, a submission every year to the federal budget process. Um, we circulate that to our members, but it's available on our website. If you wanted to have a look at what we said to government about priorities for, for this year's budget. Value for money um, is another broad development, I guess, that, that's, that's bubbling around in the system. And more and more, because of those pressures, because of those choices we have to make uh, as a community and the government on our behalf as, as community members, um, we all want to be assured as taxpayers that we're getting uh, value, value spent in health. So we've seen uh, much more of a move to evidence-based policy and it's not a point up here on the slide, but also I suppose an increasing move to, um, in some sectors in particular, aged care and disability uh, towards consumer directed care. So the principle of um, the dollar uh, following the, the patient or consumer the assumption being that they're best placed to know what their mix of care needs and service needs are and can therefore spend that funding most effectively in the most um, best directed way. So some of the some of the health implications for that concern around value for money are initiatives like the MBIS review, which Joe's discussed. Um, uh, initiatives driven independently of government, like the Choosing Wisely Australian movement, that's coordinated by the National Prescribing Service. And that's all about, you know, the professional groups and consumers getting together and really taking a good systematic look at, you know, what tests are really needed, um, what tests and procedures might be redundant, and, you know, really supporting consumers to have the conversation uh, in, the, in a, I suppose, a shared decision-making context, really, about uh, what, you know, to ask, a set of questions that, that can really uh, get to the nub of well, what do I really need? Do I really need that test at this point in time? What are my options before I get to that more um, extreme uh, test or intervention or more expensive test or intervention? And then we're seeing um, under the six pharmacy agreement, for example, there's quite a bit of money there to look at um, extending the role of pharmacists as um, primary care providers, which we think is a good move because community pharmacy is a very important and accessible sector um, and a very well regarded uh, clinical group. Uh, but the government's very concerned that any services, professional services delivered through pharmacy are evidence based. So it's quite a rigorous process of testing and piloting what those services could be before they're rolled out on a, on a wider scale. And then of course you, you would all remember um, particularly when uh, you know our current Prime Minister um, came, came to that um, position that um, the digital and innovation agenda was very big on his agenda. Um, and that's all about, you know, ensuring that our economy is dynamic, digitally sophisticated, economically competitive, all of those sorts of things. Um, opening up, you know, opportunities for science and research and employment in new markets and um, opportunities in new markets. Um, so very much about an economic agenda. So in health, we've got organisations like the Digital Transformation Agency and that agency's purview is broader than health, uh, but um, you've certainly got the Digital Transformation Agency playing a key role um, working with the Health Department and the Human Services Department on um, designing a new payment system for Medicare rebates and Medicare payments. The aim there being that um, it's quite antiquated and we've got the banking sector and the travel sector doing really smart stuff as far as customer experience goes. Why shouldn't um, healthcare consumers claiming their Medicare rebates, for example, have a similar customer experience as they go through the process of um, uh, claiming their, their um, things that they're eligible for under Medicare and PBS and those sorts of schemes. And then, of course, you've got 
and there's many of you may have been involved in the consultations that are currently happening uh, now by the Australian Digital Health Agency to develop a national digital health strategy. And that's all about um, how, you know, how we can get smarter in the digital health space to make healthcare delivery better and to better, better connect care through platforms and tools like um, shared records and my health record. Deregulation. Um, the current government and the previous government too, for that matter, had a, had a, you know have commitments around you know reducing the costs of red tape, um, and this current government has a commitment to doing that to the tune of a billion dollars a year. Um, they've they've got um, initiatives like uh, red tape reduction days in federal parliament and a number of targets in that space. Deregulation is on the radar in, in health, uh, particularly in the area of pharmacy reform and private health insurance. We'll touch on those in more detail next week. Um, but Joe might make a, might want to make a few comments because we won't what we won't touch on ne next week are some of the deregulation reform initiatives that are happening in the medicines and medical devices arena and um, some of the work that the Productivity Commission is doing looking at um, the merits of more competition and contestability in, in human services, but particularly in public dental and hospital services. Yeah, sure. Um, the medical and med medicines and medical device regulation reforms has been run out of the TGA and the government commissioned a review and they're now consulting widely. They're looking at ways to get innovative medicines and medical devices onto the market more quickly, but ensuring that they are safe. And I think we're all happy that they're going to be safe. And I think it's in everybody's interest that the red tape is reduced, but it's always got to be with safety and quality in mind. They're looking at new pathways for complementary medicines, um, looking to make it clearer to consumers what evidence there is for the effectiveness of complementary medicines and um, making sure that people who sell complementary medicines do not over exaggerate the claims of what these medi medica medicines can do, which has been a problem. They want to change the advertising rules for um, for medicines and medical devices to make it that you don't have to get your advertisement approved, but they're going to increase the penalties for doing the wrong thing. And probably most importantly from our perspective, and I think from consumers generally, they're going to really improve post-market monitoring and surveillance and reporting of adverse events. And we can all think of some bad things um, that have happened and that have not come to light because there has been poor post-market monitoring. The idea being, well, the rushes to get the medicine or the device on the market, get it being used, and then people really aren't interested in what happens after that. And so I think from our perspective, the the work that they're doing to improve that. And I think it goes back to Lloyd Sampson, who chaired the review, was very keen to say to government, before you loosen things up, let's improve post-market monitoring so that we know that on an ongoing basis, people can be feel confident that something is safe. And when problems arise, there's an alert put out and it's dealt with in a timely manner. And I think that's the key part for that one. The Pro Productivity Commission inquiry into human services is uh, looking at public hospitals, public dental services and end of life care, looking to improve competition and contestability. I think the key thing that we've taken and that it's pleasing to see in their latest report they put an emphasis on is the need for um, improvements in health literacy, improvements in people's understanding of health in order to be able to make informed choices. It's all about consumers making choice. Well, it has to be an informed choice. And we're certainly pushing very strongly that before you move to, to competition, you need to do some more work to improve the fairly low level of health literacy in this country. So back to you, Leanne. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. 
Now, you would have probably heard this term bandied around quite a lot, big, big data. All sounds very big and exciting. I mean, what, what we're really talking about here is, is the vast potential for health to piece together information that can be used to test ideas, disease management from, from diagnosis to prevention, to personalised or, or tailored treatment regimes. So links back to that point also about using data to inform evidence-based policy and, and drive better value care and choices about um, you know, how public money is used to fund health services. Um, I just wanted to quote Louise Jorm here. Uh, Louise works at the Centre for Big Data uh, in Health at the University of New South Wales. It just, I think it's a quote that illustrates um, uh, what a complex area this is. And, and Louise says the term, and it helps us certainly understand what, what the term means. She says the term big data is applied to data that by virtue of their size and or complexity pose challenges to traditional methods for management and analysis. So in health, we're talking about data that includes the millions, millions of records that are generated routinely by health services. We're also talking about real-time clinical data captured at the point of care, genomic data produced in research and clinical settings, and health-related data generated by the population at large through technologies like, like wearable devices and social media. So you can, you can see where the term big data comes from. But Louise's comment is that, you know, we're certainly sitting at a key point in history where big data is poised to become uh, and managed carefully to become a really dominant and increasingly dominant driver in what happens in health and health care. But it doesn't come without health implications. Now, technology has made big data possible, but in many ways, policy makers and organisations like ourselves are playing catch up in this space, you know, looking at safeguards and rules for these data sets after they've come into existence after the event. And some of the issues are up there on the slide, issues concerned with privacy um, from a consumer perspective, an important one. Who can see the data? How decisions are made about who can see the data? And then, then that leads to the issues of security and who has access to the data and under what conditions. It raises questions about data ownership. And that is a key one, who actually owns your health data? That's certainly come up recently in the digital health discussion and is unresolved in Australia. And then data stewardship, by that we mean, you know, who, who sets the standards for privacy and security? You know, weighing that up with individual rights um, and weighing that up with benefits for the community. Uh, and particularly the potential benefits of big data sets to be utilised for uh, better health decision making, better policy setting, and therefore, hopefully, in theory, better health outcomes for all. And then data governance is an important uh, aspect to determining who manages all of those issues around stewardship, ownership, privacy. The final sort of trend, I suppose, or, or wider um, contextual development that we wanted to, to leave you with today was um, the whole notion of, you know, regionalisation, small government, subsidiarity, I mean, you, you know, devolution, decentralisation, you might hear about those terms used interchangeably in various ways. But I guess what we're really talking about here is, you know, the, the principle of subsidiarity sounds like a policy buzzword. What we're really talking about is, you know, the, the idea that a central authority like, like the Department of Health really, really only performing functions or tasks that can't be performed at a more local level. So, you know, we're starting to see areas where the Commonwealth Government, for example, is, you know, moving responsibility down and out. Um, an example of this is staying are leaving hospitals at the state and territory level rather than any notion that the Commonwealth should look to take over hospitals, as we saw in some of the policy debates when, 
when the Rudd government was in. Um, but but more more recently, um, increased interest in the role and function that can be played by regional structures um, like primary health networks in needs-based planning, ensuring that care is much more place-based and much more relevant and targeted to the particular disease profiles and needs of local communities. That's the whole point behind primary health networks. And so what we've seen with primary health networks, particularly in, in the mental health and drug funding space in this last year is the Commonwealth um, not prescribing how uh, mental health services should be funded and, and, and uh, commissioning those themselves, but devolving um, uh, significant amounts of funding for mental health and drug and alcohol services to primary health networks to make local decisions um, about the sorts of service mixes that are that are most appropriate for their communities to put into place there. So that's the last sort of trend issue that we, we wanted to discuss with you. Um, we might stop there um, and take a few more questions. Uh, and we've got a few here, and then we'll go through in broad terms what we're going to cover in next week's webinar. So, this might be a Joe question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the question is, it's been in the news that Australia's medication is three times more expensive than New Zealand and some other countries. Is this set by the drug companies? Well, the simple answer is initially yes. Uh, the the government um, is a, the, when a medicine is listed, the pharmaceutical company will set its price. The government can decide whether it takes it or not. It has a system of negotiation and we have a thing called price disclosure and we have other which is trying to push people down to a common price. But we have traditionally, if you believe some of the research that's been done, and this question relates to some work by the uh, Stephen Duckett at the Grattan Institute, it, it, we do pay more than New Zealand. I think it's important to remember that the New Zealand system offers access to far fewer drugs than we do. They have a much more managed system of drugs. They tell doctors basically what they can prescribe, much more limited, don't have, um, don't put innovative drugs onto their system anywhere near the rate that we do. So we might pay more, uh, the government might pay more and the taxpayers might pay more, but there certainly is a different set of um, medicines that's available. So there's a second question now on, is there any data on how much is spent on private prescriptions? A lot of my meds aren't on the PBS and it gets very expensive with no safety net. Yeah, the answer is there would be that data. I don't have it uh, to hand, but it certainly was included in that 20% of other out-of-pocket costs, as, which is 20% of the general budget. And there's been an increasing trend to do um, provide medicines off-label. In other words, prescribing them for things for which the PBS did not say they should be listed, but they're quite safe to be used for that. The TGA has said they're safe, but the government hasn't decided to subsidise them. And there's a lot of people who find this and they do add up and they don't contribute to your safety net, you're quite right. And I guess they, um, there is some relief for, for some of these medications through if you have private health insurance, but not always. How does simply removing a test from the MBS list save money? Well, I guess that's me again, is it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing, that's okay. Um, well, it saves money because if it's removed from the MBS uh, rebate list, then if that means the taxpayer doesn't pay for it. So if you get a test or have an intervention or have um, surgery that isn't listed or whatever it is, if it's not on the MBS, the taxpayer pays nothing. So if you go ahead and have it, you'll meet the whole cost yourself as an individual. So if we removed some tests 
particularly tests that are commonly done, we can save quite significant amounts of money. And there's been various estimates of how much you can save, but it's um, it, it's we we believe it's quite a considerable amount. Mm. There's another question here, again related to medication. Do we need to do education on medication review for aged clients? I've seen many clients taking medications because the doctor said so. I mean, I think that's a really important question. That talks to health literacy. I think it highlights why initiatives like Choosing Wisely are so important because it is about um, ensuring that we are empowering consumers with the right information um, to ask those questions. Um, I think it also talks about um, where we need to go and where some where we're already starting to see um, you know models of care go. We already have um, pharmacists paid to do medication reviews in general practice and aged care facilities. Uh, we're starting to see primary health networks starting to do some really smart things like support pharmacists to uh, work much more closely with general practices on medication reviews. Uh, and, you know, we're starting to see under, you know, some of the debates around emergent models of care like patient-centred healthcare homes, um, how we can do that medication review work more effectively through primary care teams. So in short, yes, we do need education and it needs to be supported both on the patient side through work on health literacy, but on the provider or clinician side through more team-based care and better, better communication between prescribers, dispensers, and um, service settings like aged care. Okay, so thank you very much for your participation. That's all the questions we have logged at this stage. There's just another slide here that we'll put up. So next week's webinar, as I said, we'll be joined by our partners in the colloquium, the, the Mental Health Australia and the National Rural Health Alliance, where we'll drill down in a little bit more detail um, into some of the areas of policy development, new program development, um, uh, reviews that, that, that have really important um, implications for consumers and that we are actively engaged in at CHF and our, our partner organisations as well. So it'll be a webinar focused on the health reforms that are current and live now, the digital health strategy, mental health reform, what's happening there in terms of the government's response to the big reform report from the Mental Health Commission and the Fifth National Mental Health Plan, pharmacy uh, developments there under the current pharmacy agreement, but also the thinking and early indications around where reform might go in that space through the independent review panel that's looking there. Primary health care, we touched on healthcare homes briefly and the work of primary health network, so we'll look at those a bit more closely, that area. Um, private health insurance, that's that's probably our number one area of complaint here at CHF, and not only to us, but um, organisations like the Australian Consumer and Competition Commission. So there's a big review of that underway and um, developments in, in the rural health space as well. So on behalf of CHF, um, Joe and myself and the team here, um, we'll, we'll close now and um, we hope you found that webinar useful. Um, we would really appreciate your feedback. Um, we're more than happy to do more on themes that are of interest to our members and our wider networks. So feel free to provide that feedback to us and um, We'll speak with you next week for those that, read, that join us for that one and those that have been online today coming to the colloquium. We look forward to hosting you in Canberra. Thank you very much.